Reaction Beanie Yo 417. Day in the neighborhood. My brothers and sisters. The channel that we going back to today, I have started to realize that a lot of y'all out there like when I react to this man videos. And that man that I'm talking about is Lazy Masker Raid. Back to the lazy man, y'all. Hope y'all doing excellent out there today. And I'm glad that you came on back to the channel once again. Let's fuck with the bean. And the title of this video is The Lake Bottom Incident. Finland's most cryptic unsolved mystery. Now I don't know nothing about a lake bottom. I don't even know if I'm saying that word right. Is it lake bottom or lake bottom? Like I don't even know, y'all. I have no idea about this story, but the main thing that's just already making me feel uneasy is the unsolved mystery part. Like, I hate unsolved mysteries, man, because I need a little closure at the end of the story to just make me feel better about myself. You know what I'm saying, man? And then a lot of these unsolved mysteries, all the evidence in the world be there for the mystery to be solved. But for some reason, it still remains unsolved and it just leave us like infuriated and frustrated and just flabbergasted like mr police like you got all the evidence you need so why is this mystery still unsolved man it happens like that a lot of times now i don't know about this one but we gonna see the lazy man just put it out three days ago and i'm ready to get into it but before we get into it my brothers and sisters y'all know what y'all got to do get whatever you may need Get what you need, please. We back to lazy. Masquerade. Y'all got what y'all need. Y'all ready to go? Then let's fucking go. The lazy. The excitement of the new year has officially worn off, and for those of us running a small business, it's time to get back into the I be forgetting that the lazy start all with hit commercials, but yeah man, these unsolved mysteries just always leave you like, ugh. I wish I really knew what happened, but shout out to the lazy man, stamps.com slash uh, lazy masquerade, you know. And let's take it back right here, let's go. Demand at stamps.com forward slash lazy masquerade or click my link in the description below. Let's go. Budum in Yarvi. In English, Lake Budum. A scenic getaway just north of Espoo, Finland. Itself not far from the capital, Helsinki. Surrounded by countless pine and birch trees, the three by one kilometer lake was renowned for its tranquility. That is, until it became the setting of the country's most infamous cold case. One so cryptic and disturbing, even I was caught off guard. Mm. This is that rabbit hole. It was nearing midsummer in the heart of Suomi. Best friends, Nils Gustafsson and Seppo Boisman, both 18, arrived at the lake on their motorcycles, ready to enjoy a weekend of fishing swimming and drinking. Nils's girlfriend, Irmeli Bjorklund, and Seppo's girlfriend, Tuli Kimaki, sat on the back of their bikes, clutching tightly onto the boys as they parked by the tree line. The group made their way down to a secluded open area that Nils had picked out especially, a small peninsula that jutted out onto the water. 
that weekend was cause for celebration. Not only was Irmeli about to turn Sweet Sixteen, but it was also a fabled White Knight. A Nordic phenomenon that occurs just south of the Arctic Circle, and only at the height of summer. Not quite the same as the Midnight Sun, which occurs in the far north, White Knights are arguably even more beautiful, and inarguably, more eerie. They're the not quite nights, when, even at midnight, the sun can still be seen on the horizon. When the sky is never completely dark, even during the few hours when the sun has technically set. During such nights, nocturnal swims are far from unheard of, and Nils, Seppo, Irmeli, and Tuleki fully intended to take advantage of the warm, bright weather. The group spent that first day enjoying the still water and the fresh air, surrounded by other swimmers, boaters, and nature lovers. But by the evening, as they pitched their tent on the shoreline and sipped on pilsners in the fading light, it dawned on the lovesick teenagers that things had become hauntingly quiet. Mm. The breeze had stopped, the birds had fallen silent, and all the people that once surrounded them had gone. They were alone. The four friends crawled into their A-frame tent made for two, squished in like a can of sardines. But Nils sensed that his friend, Seppo, was anxious about something. The two boys had been inseparable since they were twelve, and Nils just knew that something was playing on Sepp's mind. It could have been the looming responsibilities of adulthood, his new job as an electrician, more the fact that Tuleki's dad didn't like him much. Indeed, her father hadn't wanted her to go to Lake Buden with Sepp in the first place. Whatever it was, Nils invited Seppo down to the shore for a heart-to-heart. -heart. He too had a few problems to get off his chest, not least that his new girlfriend, Irmeli, already had a boyfriend when they had met, mm. a guy named Pauli Pirinen. Nils and Irmeli were seeing each other behind his back. Side by side, Nils and Seppo sipped on their beers and fished with makeshift rods, chatting about the good old days, their hopes for the future, and of course, their mutual hero, Elvis Presley. I'm just sitting back wondering right now in this moment, are 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 uh Seppo and the other dude gonna kill their two girlfriends, or are all four of them about to get killed by some stranger? You know what I'm saying? Cause they they out there by themselves right now. I'm wondering which way we going with this. Let's see. The water was too cold for a swim, so Nils returned to the tent at approximately 2:30 a.m. when the sun was at its lowest casting a very thin slice of orange across the horizon. Seppo stayed out a while longer, and returned at around 3am. They settled down, and all four campers fell asleep. Only one of them would ever see the sunrise again. It might just be the one who survived, the one who killed the other three. That'll be crazy too, they ate. Anything is possible! Nils awoke that afternoon with a painful jaw, suffering from a severe case of amnesia. The last thing he remembered was lying down beside Irmeli, followed by the sound of screams and the sight of a man clothed in black with bright red eyes coming for him. As his eyes adjusted to the light, he noticed someone in a white coat standing over him. He appeared to be a doctor. That's when it dawned on Nils that he wasn't in the tent anymore. He was in the hospital. He went to speak, but even the slightest movement of his mouth was pure agony. Carefully, through semi-open lips, Nils managed to ask if he had been in a motorcycle accident. His mother, who he now noticed, sat by his side, was over the moon that Nils was awake, but hesitant to tell him what had actually happened. And so, with a heavy heart, the doctor informed Nils that at some point between 4am and 6am, a still unidentified person had approached the tent that he and his friends were sleeping in and, from the outside, cut the guy lines so that it collapsed on top of them, trapping them inside the fabric. This unknown man then blindly stabbed into the canvas with a sharp blade, and struck at the occupants with a blunt object, possibly a rock, possibly a lead pipe. Unable to escape the tent, his friends had all perished. Nils was the sole survivor. The doctor explained that special investigators were at the scene, piecing things together. 
he held back on the more grisly details. Okay, so, um, what's his name? Nails, the one who uh, survived, um, I don't think he is the one who did it. It sounded like he got attacked and blacked out, and he just so happened to survive. But now it's leading me to, um... Who the elf did it? Why they did it? Was it a random attack? You know what I'm saying? It's like you get one answer and it open up a whole another Pandora box of questions. And that's what's happening right now. I don't know, y'all. Oh, man, I hate these unsolved mysteries. Let's see if we can get some more clues. A local man had found the four campers at 11 a.m. tangled in their collapsed tent with tufts of hair, teeth, another human matter scattered around them. Seppo was still under the canvas, with two punctures to his throat and one to the chest. His head had been crushed. Tuliki was partially on top of Seppo, above the canvas, curled up in the fetal position. She had been struck twice in the head with a blunt object. A towel had been carefully placed over her head and upper torso, and she had remained alive for approximately two to three hours after the attack. Damn. Irmali was partially atop Tuliki. She had been killed by at least three blows to the forehead and cranium while still inside the tent. She had then been dragged outside and stabbed 15 times post-mortem in the neck and back. Her light green jeans had been pulled half off and her blouse had been raised above her shoulders. Nils had been found on top of Irmali with flies covering his face. He had a broken temple, a broken jaw, and had been struck on the back of the head with so much force that cerebral fluid was leaking through his nose. His cheek had been pierced so deeply by a blade that his teeth were visible through the skin. Damn! Had any more time passed, he likely wouldn't have survived. It was clear that all four campers had woken up during the attack. All of them, including Nils, had defensive marks on their arms and hands, meaning that they had tried to escape the tent, either to confront or flee from the perp. Irmili's diary was found crumpled in the mess of fabric and limbs. In it, she had written three sentences. Seppo and Nils are drunk. Awake at 2 a.m. Seppo's in the woods. Strangely, a muddy pillowcase that seemingly didn't belong to anyone in the group was found in the dirt, just outside the tent. It had been wrapped and tied with an elastic band at both ends. But just as important as what was found at the scene was what wasn't. A few items were curiously unaccounted for, including Seppo's leather jacket, all four of their wallets and IDs, and Nils's leather slip-on loafers. Sniffer dogs, metal detectorists, and divers scoured the area, but the only missing items they recovered were Nils's shoes, which were found 500 meters from the tent, hidden under a rock. On the outer surface of the shoes was a noticeable splattering of blood, it's unknown why the killer disposed of the shoes and nothing else, though two young birdwatchers did notice a 20 to 30 year old man with light brown, slick back hair and a straight build, hastily moving south through the forest at around 6am, away from the tent and in the direction the shoes were found. The two youths noticed the collapsed tent behind the man and saw what they thought was a person writhing atop the canvas, but decided not to investigate. Moments later, a young fisherman noticed that same blonde man whom he said looked about five foot eight, passing along the shoreline. Unlike the bird watchers, he had gotten a good look at the blonde man's face. With no other leads to work with, investigators took Nils back to Lake Bootham, hoping to bring some repressed memories to the forefront of his mind. When that didn't work, they decided to try a different, more experimental approach. Hypnotherapy. Mm. After being put into a trance by one Dr. Stenberg, Nils was able to recall the killer's appearance. It was a man with flowing blonde hair, big eyes, pimply skin, and distinctive facial features. This composite was drawn up based on his description. Although hypnosis is far from the most reliable forensic technique, prone to bringing up as many false memories as real ones, the young fisherman confirmed that the sketch resembled the blonde man he saw passing through the woods. So, who was this man? And what was his motive? To this day, we still don't know the answer to those questions. But there are a few compelling suspects. 
The first is Carl Valdemar Gilstrom, a 51-year-old kiosk vendor who worked just 800 meters from where the slayings had occurred. Despite running a kiosk on a popular camping ground, Carl was notoriously hostile towards campers, and was known to cut the guy lines of their tents using a long blade which he kept on his belt. He also hated cyclists, and had thrown rocks at them as they passed by, and hated thieves even more, putting razor blades in the apples that grew on his trees, not wanting anyone to pick them. Worst of all, he had shot at two people who had gotten on the wrong side of his temper. Men who had committed the awful sin of driving up the road leading to his house. Yeah, all in all, Carl wasn't the most level-headed chap. Interestingly, Seppo had gone shopping at his kiosk shortly after arriving at the lake. He was served by Carl's wife, who later went home and told her husband that at least one young camper was in the area. The following day, when a local rushed to the kiosk and told Carl about what had happened at the lake, he didn't bat an eye. Carl also filled in a well on his property later that same day, the perfect hiding place for, say, four wallets and a leather jacket. When detectives interviewed the Jilstroms, they both said that Carl was at home when the incident had taken place, sleeping in the kitchen. A search of their home turned up no evidence, and this photo, taken on June 6th, shows Cole shirtless and without a scratch on his body. Cole later confessed to a friend about being behind the Lake Budum killings, angry that some meddling kids had pitched their tent next to his kiosk. Investigators discounted his confession since they considered him psychologically disturbed. To them, I don't know y'all. I'm so 50-50 on this one, like, like I, I kind of believe that he may have did it, but then I don't believe that he did it. it, it if I just gotta, if I, if y'all just putting me, put my feet to the fire right now, I'ma say that I don't think he did it. But the dude is kind of freaking crazy with some of his past incidents, and the main one that stuck out to me is he was putting razor blades in the apples so people went uh pick them. Like think about how fucking psycho you gotta de be to do something like that. Just so people wouldn't grab these apples from off your apple tree, you freaking booby trapping them with ra razor blades. That is just different, though. That's different. Emmons, Cole's wife had no reason to give him a full salivi. She famously detested her husband, who, as you can imagine, treated her horribly. On June 13th, 1960, when mourners gathered to lay Seppo, Tuleki, and Irmeli to rest, one attendant stood out among the crowd. This photo, said to have been taken at the service, shows a man who strongly resembles the composite of the killer. The wide jaw, slicked back hair, and large eyes all match up perfectly. Though not confirmed, many believe that this man is Hans Asman, a German immigrant who lived in a small house with his wife just three miles from the lake. He had been admitted to Helsinki Hospital the day after the slings, apparently suffering from severe stomachache. He arrived unconscious, but one doctor thought that Hans was squeezing his eyes shut. Thinking he may be faking his condition, the doctor tickled Hans. He woke up immediately and began barking orders at the staff, threatening them and demanding treatment. A nurse noted that when he arrived, Hans's fingernails were filthy, his shoes were caked in thick mud and his clothes had mysterious red stains all over them. Hans was a dead ringer for the man seen at Lake Budum, and it's worth noting that the day after these composites were distributed throughout Finland, he shaved his hair short, presumably to avoid comparison. Boy, that damn picture damn show look just like you, Hans. I'm just saying, man, that picture, they're almost spot on. But I don't even know if I can believe that he did it. You know what I'm saying? It's evidence pointing towards that him or Carl did it. You know, it's a little evidence. These damn unsolved mysteries, y'all. I don't know. I don't even know if I can go with him just yet. But I believe he did. it's more probable that he did it than the first guy. I will say that. Hans was something of an enigma. A man with a past muddled by rumors and lies. He had served as a soldier in the German army during World War II and locals gossiped that he'd been a guard at Auschwitz. Though that was likely a myth, there is evidence that he served in the Luftwaffe and was accustomed to violence. Having fallen in love with a Jewish girl, his commander sent him to the Eastern Front, where he was captured by the Russians in 1943. Hans then claimed to have been recruited into the KGB and told people that he was working in Finland for them as an agent. 
During an end-of-life interview in 1997, a journalist asked Hans if he'd like to talk about the Lake Budum incident. Hans replied, I'm not going to talk about the details. I'm not going to accept or deny anything. Interestingly though, he did confess to being behind the death of Kuli Kisari, who, in 1953, had been found in a swamp after disappearing on a bike ride. He said that while on a KGB operation, he and a fellow agent crashed into Kuliki and hid her remains in a nearby bog. While my friend was a good driver, it couldn't be prevented. You know what I'm saying. That confession sounds damning at first, but Hans had a tendency to insert himself into cases that he had nothing to do with. He tried to do the same with the 1959 Tuli Lati double homicide, for which two other men were later found responsible and it was later proven that he'd actually been out of the country when Kuliki was slain. On top of that, when it came to the Lake Baldum case, Hans had what police considered a strong alibi. On the night of the slaughter, Hans had spent the entire evening in Helsinki with his mistress, as well as her sister and her sister's husband. All three of them corroborated his story. Assuming they were telling the truth, and Hans wasn't responsible for the massacre, then who was? A few other suspects on the police's radar included Kivetashko, the stone pocket, a man in his early 20s who was known to walk around with a pillowcase full of rocks which he had used to swipe at people. Not only did he live in Espo, but the fact that a pillowcase was found at the scene made him a strong person of interest. That being said, no rocks were found in the Bodum pillowcase, and no other evidence links the stone pocket to the slayings. How about Pauli Pirenen? Irmeli's boyfriend, whom she was cheating on. Perhaps mm. he had learned about her infidelity and followed her to Lake Bodum. He said, That's a nice uh, theory right here, that maybe it's the boyfriend who found out that you cheating on me with this dude and he showed up to that campsite and just went crazy. That's a possibility. And he had a motive, but didn't have a vehicle with which to get to the lake. Some assert that he got a ride with Osmo and Ismo Yakula two friends that he had been seen with on the night of the incident. Thing is, the crime scene didn't suggest the presence of more than one perpetrator. Then perhaps this really was the work of an opportunistic stranger, one who had been watching the four happy campers that day, one who kept watching as they laid their heads down. The vast Finnish woodland is known to harbour unusual folks, people who want to escape civil society. Indeed, Dozens of wanted fugitives were found hiding around the woodland of Espo during the manhunt for the Lake Baldum Slayer. None of them were responsible for the incident, but it goes to show that some less than savoury characters were wandering around out there. There was one other key suspect that we haven't covered yet, one who only came under suspicion once the ice on this court case had thawed. In 2004, nearly 44 years after his friends had been butchered, a 61-year-old, Niels Gustafsson, received a knock on his front door. Standing on his porch were several police officers. He asked if there had been a breakthrough in the Lake Baldum case. They confirmed there had been, and that he was under arrest. And I wanted to say that earlier, y'all. I promise you I wanted to say that maybe it is him. I was starting to think about it more and more, but my only thing is he went to the hospital with all those injuries too. So how could it have been him? And unless he, after he killed him, he did, he, I don't see how you can turn around and just start stabbing and injuring yourself like that. You got to be sick as hell to be able to do that to yourself, man. But people out here really are sick as hell. So, hey, let's see what evidence point towards him. If the police then came and arrested him, they got to have some evidence. And I'm ready to hear it. In the decades following the incident, forensic analysis had become much more sophisticated with the advent of DNA testing. Given how well known the Lake Bullum slayings were, cold case investigators had returned to a few pieces of evidence on file and sent them in for analysis. Criminologists were able to more accurately piece together the events of that fateful night in June 1960, and the facts suggested that Nils, the sole survivor, was in reality the perpetrator. The authorities compiled a list of facts which proved his involvement, and, in March 2004, charged him with taking the lives of his three tentmates. He was remanded for nearly a year and a half before his trial, which began on August 4th, 2005. 
Here were the new facts, as presented by the prosecution. Firstly, that the shoes found in the woods, the ones which belonged to Nils, had been examined. A DNA test proved that the blood covering them belonged to Tuliki, and curiously, not Nils. None of his was found on either the outside or the inside. In fact, no blood was found on the inside of the shoes at all. It stood to reason that whoever had committed the act had been wearing Nils' shoes at the time. Secondly, they brought up Nils' memory loss. The accused claimed to not remember the details of the slaughter after being struck on the head, which their specialists claimed wasn't possible. Although a patient may suffer from short-term amnesia after such a strike, it wouldn't result in permanent memory loss. Thirdly, several new witnesses had come forward. One was a young woman who had been at Lake Bodum that night in 1960, camping at a public site with three friends. She claimed to have seen Nils arguing with Seppo by the lake. Another was a woman who had encountered Nils at a bus stop in the 80s. He had apparently confessed to her randomly. The final new witness was the lead investigator working the case. While being interrogated in 2004, Nils had admitted off the record that he was the man they were looking for, and said, What's done is done. I'll get 15 years for it. Fourthly, they argued that since Irmeli had been savaged the most, her killer must have been motivated by feelings of jealousy or betrayal. And that's another thing too, she did get like the worst of it. Like she got stabbed all those times, got pulled out of the tent and all that. Like it seemed like whoever did this really like had some hatred for her specifically. I don't know y'all, I'm still on the fence, but I do want to kind of like believe that it is him who did it. It's just, it'd be so sad if he is the one who did it just to think that he got away with it for all these freaking years. That shit happened back in the 60s and it's the 2000s, the early 2000s now. That is crazy if he got away that long. She was the perpetrator's main target. The other two victims were just in the way. Since Nils was Irmeli's boyfriend, he was the most likely suspect. Based on these facts, the prosecution suggested how the events of that night unfolded. Irmeli had rejected Nils' advances, and when he became more forceful, Seppo protected her and kicked Nils out of the tent. In a drunken rage, Nils bided his time and then slaughtered the group while they slept. First the main threat, Seppo, then his rejector, Irmeli, and finally the only witness, Tuligi. Noticing that he was still wearing his shoes, which were now splattered red, he rushed to the woods, hid them as best he could, and realized his only chance of evading justice was to paint himself as a victim. He proceeded to smash his head against one of the trees, stumbled back to the collapsed tent in his socks, and waited for a passerby to call for help. The defense took umbrage with the so-called indisputable facts. To the prosecution's first point, the splattered shoes, the defense highlighted that like any hygienic Finn who was going camping in dry weather, Nils had left his footwear outside the tent. Anyone could have slipped them on before committing the atrocity. Additionally, if he'd been the one to dump the shoes in the woods, why were his feet and socks completely clean when he was found? Wouldn't they have gotten dirty during his walk back? They also countered the prosecution's claim that Nils couldn't have had permanent memory loss. In actuality, their specialist was wrong. Lifelong amnesia is not only possible after the type of brain damage he had sustained, but common. The credibility of the three new witnesses was also questioned. The woman who claimed to have seen Nils arguing with Seppo by the lake was proven to be a liar. Not only could she not name the three friends she was with at Lake Bodum, but the public campsite she claimed to have stayed at didn't even exist in the 1960s. The woman at the bus stop was a known fantasist who had lied in the past for publicity. The lead detective had no proof that Nils had confessed to him. Besides, it's relatively common for innocent people to crack after an interrogation and make false confessions. One witness who was credible was the young fisherman who had seen the blonde suspect fleeing the scene at Lake Bodum. He had confirmed that the blonde man wasn't Nils. Public defenders then addressed the alleged motive, that this was a crime of passion. Nils had only met Irmeli three weeks prior, would he really throw his life and his best friend's life away over such a small matter? Would it really have angered him so deeply? 
Having debunked the prosecution's main arguments, the defense asked the jury to consider the actual version of events at Lake Bodom. Did anyone really believe that Nils would smash his head against a tree multiple times to fake his innocence? That's what I was saying earlier, man. Like, it's just hard for me to believe that he beat himself up like that just to fake. Like, boy, like, like I said, you got to be a crazy motherfucker to goddamn hurt yourself like that just to try to prove that somebody actually hurt you and killed your friends. Like, I don't know, y'all. I'm on the fence, man. I'm still on the fence. I fucking hate these unsolved goddamn mysteries. Ugh. And with enough force to not only break his jaw, but also to spill brain fluid. To slash his cheek and expose his teeth. That would require not only superhuman levels of resolve, but also superhuman levels of stupidity. Speaking of stupidity, the defense hammered home one massive failure made by the authorities. During their initial investigation, they hadn't cordoned off the crime scene. As a result, Newsmen and onlookers had trampled and displaced crucial evidence, and it was now impossible to say what had been compromised and what hadn't. That, at the very least, should make the jury doubt the prosecutor's so-called facts. Ultimately, the jury determined that the evidence was inconclusive, and the motive speculative. Nils Gustafsson was acquitted of all charges and received 45,000 euros in compensation from the state. Damn. In a statement made to the press, he announced. Although I don't remember the attack, I know for certain I wasn't responsible. I'm innocent. And that's that. In the years following the trial, further DNA tests were conducted on the shoes. Blood was eventually found on their insides, meaning that nobody was wearing the shoes when the killings took place. The splatter on their outsides also matched the splatter found at the tent's entrance. Nulse had been telling the truth. He really had left his shoes outside the tent. Nils Gustafsson, now 81 years old, is considered to be completely innocent by most people actively following the case. Yet, due to extensive media coverage of his trial, around 50% of Vince still believe he was involved in the murders. This is largely due to the fake information fed to the media by the prosecutors, who claimed that Nils hadn't even been injured in the Lake Bodom attack. That was demonstrably untrue. The fuck? As if to exonerate Nils further, there's one piece of key evidence we need to talk about. That muddy pillowcase. The one found just outside the tent on the morning of June 5th. Both blood and male fluid were found on it. That fluid was DNA profiled in the early 2000s. And crucially, it didn't belong to either Seppo or Nils. Oh, well, there you go then. That's all the evidence we need. This was just a complete... I, all right, y'all. I'm, I, this, I'm, this is what I'm going with, man. I, I think I, I have went from 50-50 to 75-25 that I believe is a freaking stranger out there. Just was a stranger who caught these kids out on the beach, you know what I'm saying, and just decided to kill them for some reason and probably was attempted to or tried to at the beginning... Um, and say the, the girls, you know what I'm saying, or one of them, or whatever. I don't think it was, uh, I can't even think of his name right now, but I don't think it was that guy, man. I don't think it was Nils. I don't think it was him. Although Hans Asman has long since passed, his son sent a sample of his DNA to be analyzed. He had to know if his father was the man responsible for the horrors at Lake Budum. The results came back. No match. As for Cole, the kiosk man, his still-living son refuses to submit a sample of his DNA. Maybe because he doesn't want the world to know what his father had done. Maybe because he doesn't want to know himself. At this point, every other suspect's DNA has been ruled out but his. Years later, Cole Gilstrom's wife admitted to a friend that her husband hadn't been at home on the night of the slayings. Mm. He had asked her for an alibi, and she had gone along with his request fearful of incurring his wrath if she didn't. His whereabouts on the night of the sling remains uncertain. As mentioned, Carl had supposedly confessed to a friend about his involvement in the case. Apparently, that same friend replied, Well, if you're telling the truth, Carl, go down to the lake right now and drown yourself. Mm. Because otherwise, you'll spend the rest of your life in a small cell. And wouldn't you know, 
Carl Jostrom did drown in Lake Budum in 1969, the day after making that confession. Today, more than 63 years on, the Lake Budum incident of 1960 remains Finland's most well-known cold case, inspiring books and death metal bands alike. And although the identity of the killer remains a mystery, and likely always will, many Finns have their suspicions. Let me know yours in the comments. And until next time, happy camping. Man, the end of that one, y'all, kind of made me think it was Carl. I don't know, man. That, that's crazy. He, he went and drowned himself the day after he confessed to that whoever it was, the lady or whoever, that I, I'm i the one who did it. Then she told him, hey, you need to go goddamn go back down there and drown yourself. Like, I don't know, y'all. I still don't even really know if it was him or not. See, this is what I told y'all, man. I hate these freaking unsolved mysteries, man. There's no freaking closure. I'm just gonna say rest in peace to the three that lost their lives, man. The two young ladies and the young man that lost their life, man. Um, Nails, all I'm gonna say is, bro, I don't think you did it, but if you did it, boy, you going, when you get to hell, it's gonna be hell with gasoline draws on when you get down there. If you did it, that's all I'm gonna say, man, because the, 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 the way you covering this up, and like I said, the, if he was to do it, y'all, that happened in the 60s, is the 2024, you know what I'm saying, how long he would have been out, like, and free, that's what, like, 60 fucking plus years or something, man, that is crazy, man, I don't know, though, I don't know if he freaking did it, y'all, oh, man. I'm going to stay with what I said, man. Long story, short story, long. Just stick with what I said. I think it was some kind of freaking strange out there. Y'all let me know down in the comments what the hell y'all think, too. I love to hear. But um, I'm just going to say that I think it was a freaking uh, just strange out there because we have watched a million videos over here on our channel about goddamn strangers just randomly killing people group of people attacking people and stuff so i think it was just one of those type of incidents man especially with their age and stuff you know they kids and stuff and i'm just gonna leave it at that and i digress hope y'all hit that like button hope y'all comment subscribe and do all that and come on back tomorrow for Coffee Man Fridays. But until then, my friends, you know I got to say this. Little peace and happiness. Stay safe. Don't stop. Keep going. Yeah.